If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Isaiah chapter 14. Carol in Aaron's writes this, As a kid, I loved Mission Sundays, when missionaries on furlough brought special reports to the church. There is one visit I've never forgotten. The missionaries were a married couple stationed in what appeared to be a particularly steamy jungle. They gave a full report on people saved, churches planted, and translations begun. What has always stayed with me is the story they shared about a snake, she said. One day they told us an enormous snake, much longer than a man, slithered its way right through their front door and into the kitchen of their simple home. Terrified, they ran outside and searched frantically for a local who might know what to do. A machete-wielding neighbor came to the rescue, calmly marching into the house and decapitating the snake with one clean chop. The neighbor reemerged triumphant and assured the missionaries that the reptile had been defeated. But there was a catch, he warned. It was going to take a while for the snake to realize it was dead. A snake's neurology and blood flow are such that it can take considerable time for it to stop moving even after decapitation. For the next several hours, the missionaries were forced to wait outside while the snake thrashed about, smashing furnace furniture and flailing against walls and windows, wreaking havoc until its body finally understood that it no longer had a head. Sweating in the heat, they felt frustrated and a little sickened, but also grateful that the snake's rampage wouldn't last forever. And at some point in their waiting, they told us they had a mutual epiphany. Do you see it? asked the missionary. I leaned in with the rest of the congregation, queasy and fascinated. Satan is a lot like that big old snake. He's already been defeated. In the meantime, though, he's going to do some damage. But never forget that he's a goner. He told us we are in the thrashing time, but always remember it won't last forever. Our Savior has already crushed the serpent's head. By the cross of Christ and his finished work, he defeated sin, death, and Satan. Colossians 2.15 says Christ spoiled Satan and the demonic angels. He's crushed the serpent's head. I like how Hebrews 2.14 says, Through death Christ destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Satan's been overwhelmed. He's been conquered by our Savior. It's all downhill for Satan in the future. But today we are. We're in that thrashing time where Satan is desperately clinging to his false hope of still overthrowing the plans and purposes of God somehow. Satan is God's enemy, and that being so, he's our enemy, and he attacks God through us. But in 2 Corinthians 2.11, Paul writes, For we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. And it's important for us to not be ignorant of Satan or his devices, so we don't give him an advantage over us in the battle. When? He attacks us with his schemes. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12 says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Satan is a created being. We could almost close this message in prayer with that. It's vital in knowing our enemy. He is not God. He is not a God. He is limited. He's not eternal. He's not all-knowing. He's not all-powerful. He's not all-present. And that's why in this verse he can be fallen and cut down to the ground. He was originally created as one of God's highest angels. In his appearance he sparkled with all the jewels of created beauty. And you see this in Ezekiel 28:13. Every precious stone was thy covering. Sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, gold. Ezekiel tells us he was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So the world's pictures of him with a red suit, pitchfork, and horns is a ploy of Satan to deceive. He was the anointed cherub that covereth, Ezekiel 28:14 says. He was created for the glory of God, and as a cherub, he was given the exalted privilege of covering or guarding God's throne, and he had continuous, unrestricted access to the glorious presence of God in the third heaven. But Satan rebelled against his creator, 
tried to usurp his power and glory, and his heart was lifted up because of his beauty, and iniquity was found in him, Scripture says. And as a result, he led a great number of angels in a rebellion against God. And that rebellion that began then, it continues right now to this very moment. Isaiah here speaks of a mighty leader whose unbridled pride has caused him to fall from a lofty position and be brought to destruction. This leader is Lucifer, Satan himself, who this is ultimately speaking about. The name Lucifer given to Satan means day star or shining one. And then it says son of the morning. And that speaks to this shining one belonging to the morning or being only a morning star. The title of morning star, son of the morning, is pertaining to Satan. is a picture of how the light of a star in the morning vanishes away when the sun rises. How the far greater splendor of the rising sun causes the morning star's light to be swallowed up and to vanish away. And so Lucifer, the angel of light and son of the morning, is overwhelmed by the rising of the son of righteousness, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. The once bright star, which did weaken the nation here, is pictured as fallen, cut down, and defeated. Because Lucifer proudly asserted his will above the will of God, in the past, he was cut down, and he fell from his position in the third heaven. But in the present, as that verse shows here, it's still true to this moment, uh, Satan rules over the unbelieving world system, and he weakens the nations, as verse 12 says here. Satan is the controlling and manipulating spirit behind the world's godless and wicked activities, and is behind its opposition of Christ and the Word of God and the church, the body of Christ. Satan is the God of this world, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. And as he is, he works to what verse 12 says here, to weaken the nations. On his radio program, Paul Harvey once read this entitled, If I Were the Devil. If I were the devil, I would gain control of the most powerful nation in the world. I would delude their minds into thinking that they had come from man's effort instead of God's blessings. I would promote an attitude of loving things and using people instead of the other way around. I would dupe entire states into relying on gambling for their state revenue. I would convince people that character is not an issue when it comes to leadership. I would make it legal to take the life of unborn babies. I would cheapen human life as much as possible so that the life of animals are valued more than human beings. I'd take God out of the schools, or even the mention of his name was grounds for a lawsuit. I would come up with drugs that sedate the mind. I would get control of the media so that every night I could pollute the mind of every family member for my agenda. I would attack the family, the backbone of any nation. I would compel people to express their most depraved fantasies on canvas in the movie screens, and I would call it art. I would convince the people that right and wrong are determined by a few who call themselves authorities and refer to their agenda as politically correct. I would persuade people that church is irrelevant and out of date and the Bible is for the naive. And I would dull the minds of Christians and make them believe that prayer and church attendance is not important and that faithfulness and obedience are optional. If I were the devil, I guess I would just leave things just as they are. Satan is real. Satan is alive. Satan is at work. Satan is the God of this world is working hard to weaken and destroy this country and every other country in the world because he hates man. He wants to destroy each nation and each and every life. He wants to blind the world to the gospel, to do everything in his power to keep men and women, boys and girls from trusting Christ as their personal savior. Isaiah chapter 14 verses 13 to 15 says, 
For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Satan fell because of his great pride. He exalted himself in the past. He exalts himself now. But he has and he will be brought down and humiliated as this passage shows. His heart is not bent in submission. And he remains defiant to this moment, full of arrogance and his rebellion against God. He sets his will over the will of God and above it. You see such a stark contrast here between Satan and our Savior. Our Savior prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And Satan here, you see him saying the opposite. He's saying, my will, not thine, be done. Lucifer, in his selfish determination to replace God himself as the ruler of all, in his refusal to submit to him, instead says, I will, I will, I will, I will. I will. You find here five foolish and fatal I wills of Satan. And so, as we are not ignorant of Satan's devices, we know that Satan will tempt us in life with pride. He'll tempt us to be like him, to do what we desire, to make much of ourselves, that we know what's best, that we refuse to submit to God's will, we refuse to submit to God's authority and his word. Satan's ploy in the garden is the same ploy he uses today to tempt us to think that we shall be as gods. And we'll be tempted in life to invert and reverse reality and live like we kill all the shots. That we know what's best and we try to make God our servant. When the truth is, God's in control. He always knows what's best and we are to submit and serve him. Though fallen from heaven... Satan says in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. He desires the very abode of God to be his own, desiring the throne of God. He desires to set himself up as supreme. He doesn't acknowledge the authority of God or anyone being superior to himself. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, Go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Are you prepared to share the message of grace with others? According to the Scriptures by Pastor Paul Sadler is a booklet of charts along with narrative that fits nicely in your Bible cover and gives a more detailed approach for those who have a knowledge of the Scriptures but fail to see Paul's apostleship and message. To order according to the Scriptures, contact Berean Bible Society at P.O. Box 756 Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022, or call 262-255-4750, or visit online at www.BereanBibleSociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. Satan says, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Satan as an angel is called a morning star, and the stars of God are a reference to the elect angelic hosts 
and speaks of how Satan desires the worship, adoration, homage, and service of these angels. Verse 13 says, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Psalm 48, 1 to 2, there is an important cross reference where it says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. And so when it talks here about I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, it's talking about Mount Zion. And this phrase here refers to Satan's desire to rule and to reign from the temple in Jerusalem, the city of the great king, and be king over all, establishing his own kingdom on the earth. Imitation of God and his plan is Satan's basic strategy. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, it says next in verse 14. His desire is to rise to such immense and glorious heights that he would be so venerated and revered above all that only he would receive all glory and honor and praise by all. I will be like the Most High, verse 14 says. It's interesting to note here the name for God that's used here in the original. It's El Elyon, which means the strongest strong one. Now, you can't be stronger than the strongest strong one. So Satan doesn't desire to be different from God. He wants to be like him. He knows he can't be greater than God, but he wants to be like the strongest strong one who is over all. While Satan desires to ascend up, verse 15 shows he will be brought down. He will be humiliated and he will be brought down to hell, to the sides or to the lowest depths of the pit of hell in the judgment of God. Satan's fall is in stages. He fell from heaven. You see that in verse 12. He is cast down to the ground. It says that in verse 12 too. And then verse 15, it says that yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. So he was cast out of the third heaven at his initial rebellion. He'll be cast out of the second heaven to the earth during the tribulation period. And then when Christ comes back to establish his millennial kingdom, he takes Satan and casts him into the center of the earth or the bottom of his pit for a thousand years during the millennial kingdom. And then from there, he's cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. So it's down down, down, down. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Satan and devil are the names most commonly used of our spiritual enemy. But his names and his descriptions teach us a lot about him and his tactics. Satan means adversary or opposer. He is diametrically opposed to all that is good and all that is God's. Devil is from the Greek word diabolos and means accuser or slanderer. Revelation 12 verse 10 tells us that he is the accuser of the brethren. He desires to have something evil that can be said of us to discredit us and to destroy our testimonies for Christ. 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, the evil one. He's called the great dragon, a roaring lion, and the serpent in Scripture. In Scripture, we see him opposing God's work. He perverts God's word. He impedes God's servants. He hinders the gospel. And he ensnares people through false teaching. And appearing as an angel of light, he deceives. Paul talks about Satan's wiles here in chapter 6 and verse 11. And that word wiles speaks of the devil's methods, his plotting, his scheming, his plans, his strategies and trickery by which he tries to make us fall in the Christian life and lead us away from the Lord and serving him. It's kind of like a game plan for a football game where you have a strategy against the opposing team and you run specific plays against them, and you have a plan to defeat 
your foe. You examine their weaknesses and you exploit those weaknesses in the game. Satan does that. The trickery and the deceptive strategies and schemes of Satan have been very effective for thousands of years against mankind and it all started right back in the Garden of Eden. Kent Crockett rightly put it, he says, the devil has a master's degree in trichonometry. And he is about tricks. Think of the wisest man in the Bible, Solomon. Think about the strongest man in the Bible, Samson. Think about one of the most devoted men in your Bible, David, and how Satan schemed and plotted, plotted against these men and how each of these men fell from the temptation of lust and fornication. So if we think that we're wise enough, if we think that we're strong enough, if we think that we're devoted enough to stand against the wiles of the devil, we should think again and turn to the Lord and be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Think of God's chosen people, the nation of Israel, and how when you read your Old Testament, you see this over and over again, God telling them, about idolatry and his hatred of it and how he doesn't want them to go after other gods because there's only one true and living God and he's a jealous God. But Satan schemed and Israel intermarried with pagan nations and that brought in the idolatry into the nation and it was openly practiced in the nation. Even within the temple of God it was um, practiced in the Old Testament. They lost their witness as God's light, and they fell. And the devil today, he schemes against the body of Christ, seeking to make us fall, trying to turn our hearts from God, seeking to make us lose our witness as God's light. And just like with Adam and Eve, he plants doubts in our mind. A doubt here, a doubt there, into our minds about the goodness of God. And he tries to lead us away subtly, away from our relationship with Christ, away from trusting God in our lives. He tempts us with immorality, with worldliness, with pride, with self-reliance. The term wiles was also often used of a wild animal which stalked and then unexpectedly pounced on its prey. Ephesians 4.14 says this, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Those words, lie in wait, are the exact same Greek word translated wiles here. And so Satan stalks us like that. He patiently lies in wait, watching us, observing our weaknesses, waiting for just the right moment to strike and to attack us. And so that shows us the importance of having a consistent Christian life, a consistent testimony, a faithful, ever-deepening relationship with God through prayer and His Word so we might be ready because we never know when He might strike. In the United States, mountain lions are the animal regarded as the number one human predator. Author Craig Childs was on foot doing research on the lions in Arizona's Blue Range Wilderness. As he approached a water hole, he spotted a mountain lion drinking water. The lion did not notice his presence. When it finished drinking, it walked slowly away into a cluster of junipers. After a few minutes, Childs walked to the water hole to identify tracks in the mud and record notes. Just before he bent down to look closer, he scanned the perimeter, and there among the shadows of the junipers, 30 feet away, he saw a pair of eyes. He expected the lion to run away, but it walked into the sunlight and towards him. Childs pulled his knife and stared into the eyes of the lion. He knew what he had to do. More importantly, he knew what he must not do, and he writes this. Mountain lions are known to take down animals six, seven, and eight times their size. Their method? Attack from behind, clamp onto the spine at the base of the prey skull, and snap the spine. I hold firm to my ground. If I run, if I give it my back, it is certain I will have a mountain lion all over me. 
the mountain lion begins to move to my left and I turn, keeping my face on it, my knife at my right side. It paces to my right, trying to get around me on the other side. To get behind me, I turn right and I stare right at it. Childs maintains that defense as the mountain lion continues to try to provoke him to run, turning left, then right, back and forth, again and again, trying to get behind him. Finally, the standoff ended. The lion turned and walked away defeated because of one who knew what to do in its presence. The Apostle Paul had a knowledge of his adversary, Satan, and his demons. Because he knew Satan's methods and was not ignorant of his devices, he was able to stand against the wiles and attacks of the devil. Satan is a human predator, and just as Childs knew what to do in the face of attack from the lion, so through knowing and trusting God and his word, we can know what to do when Satan attacks. To first turn to the Lord and trust him and be strong in him is the very first step. And in knowing our enemy and his methods and strategies given to us by God's word and seen in the examples of his attacks on those in the Bible, and in our experience in the Christian life, we too will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And we can be strong in the Christian life, knowing the truth of the words of the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. I like these lyrics which says, And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. Thank you for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. Join us next time when we're going to be in Ephesians 6, looking at God's armor for the spiritual battle.